2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 3. It says, Now therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man of war is entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning so thankful for your word that you give us. Father, we pray that you'd help us to take your word to apply it to our life and to leave here better people because of it. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friday was Veterans Day. Now, we want to, as always, honor the veterans, all the veterans, and especially those that are here with us in the service this morning. As well as the veterans that are here, we want to remember the families of those who have lost loved ones in service of our country. We also want to remember the families and the, uh, of those who are fighting for our freedoms right now. One of the best ways that I know to honor the veterans, to honor these men and women, is to take a look at what's required to become a true veteran of the cross of Jesus Christ. This morning and every morning, there's two flags up here on this podium. There's the American flag and the Christian flag. One represents our country. The other represents our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and His kingdom. To serve either of these flags and kingdoms that they represent faithfully and effectively, we have to meet certain requirements. There are certain things that, that we have to do. Before someone can become a veteran, first of all, they have to be a soldier. Webster's Dictionary says that a veteran is a person who has had long service or experience in an occupation, office, or the like. In other words, like a, a veteran of the police force, for example. Also, it says the person who has served in a military force, especially during war, of a soldier having served in a military force, especially during war, and experienced through long service of practice, such as a veteran member of Congress, of or pertaining to veterans. So this morning, I want us to look at what's required to be a good soldier, and maybe that'll help us to become a true veteran of the Army of God. <coughs> first of all, before you can become a soldier, the first thing you have to do is volunteer. Y'all know the United States of America no longer forces men uh, or women to serve in the military anymore. They ask for volunteers to serve. Now, recruitment officers are sent out, and they want to encourage you to serve in the, in the, in the military, and they're looking for volunteers all the time. But we're no longer forced to serve in the military. Likewise, God doesn't force anyone to serve in His kingdom. But He does plead with us to volunteer and come to salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He also sends out recruitment officers to help urge people to serve in his army. Did you know about that? Jeremiah 44, verse 4, it says, How be it I sent you, sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, for not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repent. Don't you see, God has pleading with us today. He has sent out servants. He sent out messengers, begging the sinner to come and serve Him with us. Besides the wonderful life that you can have with Jesus Christ, the retirement plan is excellent. Next thing you've got to have to serve in God's army is complete. You see, when, when you serve this flag right here, you have to have faith in the American government that that's going to supply all your needs. The government's going to, going to supply you with all the food, with all the clothing, with all the shelter that you're ever going to need. You know, you're even supplied your companions by the government when you serve on the flag. When you serve this flag and the Savior that it represents, you also have to have faith in the one who's called you to serve. And he's going to supply all your needs. You don't have to worry about your physical needs when you serve with God, when you serve with Jesus. Matthew 6, 31 through 33 says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Did you know that Jesus will even provide you with godly company and keep with you? First John 1 John 1.3 says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. 
First John 1, then going down 6 through 7 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Listen, when it comes to faith, the Lord wants us to be truly better, experienced through long service. Right. Thirdly, we have to be completely committed. When you serve this way, you're expected to be completely committed to your country and to allow nothing to get in the way of you doing your duty and doing what, what you're commanded to do and to perform faithfully. Likewise, when you serve this way, you're also expected to commit to Jesus and His kingdom fully and wholly. You're expected to serve Him faithfully, not allowing anything to keep you from doing God's will. Luke 5 11 says, When they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed Him. Luke 5 27 through 28 says, And after these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said to him, Follow me. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. He left all. He didn't, he didn't argue with him and said, well, Wait a minute, Jesus, I've got to finish this up first. Wait a minute, Jesus, I, I've got to take some things with me. I've got to go home and get packed up. He left all right then. He was fully committed to serving Jesus Christ. Luke 14, 33 says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. And that's a tough one. Sometimes it's hard to forsake all that we have. Sometimes we work our whole lives and, and we begin to, to accumulate things and, and we get a certain amount of, 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 of wealth that we really want to hold on to. But Jesus said we've got to be willing to forsake that. Not that we have to give it all away but that we have to love Him more than we love the things of this world. Otherwise, He said, you keep peace in sight. Philippians 3.8 says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. No, commitment requires discipline. Several years ago in England, there was a man named Sir John Bogorol. And he was conducting this great symphony orchestra before a, a standing room only audience. Yeah, and, and it was just jam-packed full and there was no more, there were no more seats. And, 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 and as they were there, people began to look around. And they looked around and they noticed there was a preacher there. Now this orchestra hall was kind of interesting because during the week, Monday through Saturday, it served as a, as a place for things like orchestras and plays and, and cultural events. But then on Sundays, it served as a church. It was where they held their religious services at. And as they looked around, they saw that preacher there. One guy looked over at the preacher. He said, uh, when are you going to fill this hall on Sunday the way Sir John Barbaroli has tonight? The preacher looked over at him and looked him dead in the eye. With a steady voice, he said, I'll fill this hall on Sunday morning. When you give to me as you gave to Sir John tonight, 85 disciplined men and women to be with me and to work with me. Requires discipline. Fourth, requires complete obedience. See, when you serve this way, you're required to follow orders and you're expected to be obedient to the letter. You don't ask questions, you do as you're told. When you serve this way, Jesus expects no less. Matthew 26 19 says, And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready for the Passover. John 14 21 says, He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Isaiah 1, 19 and 20 says, If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Y'all know who John Newton is? You, 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 you really do, you just don't know you do. John Newton wrote probably one of the most famous hymns that was ever written. John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. John Newton said something that I really like. He said this. If two angels in heaven were given assignments by God at the same time, one of them to go and rule over the greatest nation on earth and the other to go sweep the streets of the dirtiest village, each angel would be completely indifferent as to which one got which assignment. It simply wouldn't matter to them. Why? Because the real joy lies in being obedient to God. For a follower of Jesus Christ, the important thing isn't what God has us doing. The important thing is that we're doing what God wants us to do. 
Listen, the important thing for us as, as members of the army of God is that we're doing what God wants us to do. No matter what that is. Listen, you might be on the front line and you might be, be the guy peeling potatoes, but either way, you're serving God and doing what God wants you to do. That's all that's important. Listen, nobody is any better than anybody else in God's army. God leads all of us, and we all do as we're told. What's important is that you're serving God and that you're being obedient to Him. Fifth and finally, requires complete devotion. You see, when you serve this way, you expect it to be completely devoted to the country it represents. Daniel Webster defined devotion like this. He said, it's earnest attachment to a cause, a person, profound dedication, especially to religion, consecration. When you serve this flag, Jesus expects you to be completely and wholly devoted to him and his kingdom. I found a point that rings true to me, and I believe it probably does to many of y'all also, and I want to read it to you this morning. It says, one day I looked at myself, at the self that Christ can see. I saw the person I am today and the one I ought to be. I saw how little I really pray and how little I really do. I saw the influence of my life, how little of it was true. I saw the bundle of faults and fears I all the way on the shelf. I had given a little bit to God, but I hadn't given myself. I came from seeing myself with my mind made up to be, the sort of person that Christ can use with a heart in the Holy Spirit. In order to be a true spiritual veteran, you've got to be completely devoted to the service of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To become true veterans of the cross, the first thing we have to do is to be good soldiers of the cross. My prayer this morning is that the Lord will help us all to become true spiritual veterans. Let's pray. Our great Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning so thankful for the love that you've shown. Father, we're thankful for the privilege and the opportunity to be able to serve the army of God. Father, we talk about spiritual warfare a lot. We talk about the enemy attacking us a lot. But Father, very seldom do we realize that we're soldiers on the front line of this war. And Father, we pray that you would be with us and bless us. Father, give us the wisdom, the courage, and the strength that we need to be able to do the things that are pleasing to you and become true spiritual veterans in the army of Jesus Christ. So in his name we pray.